Above the Basement, Boston Music and Conversation is recorded at beautiful Woods Hill Table Restaurant in West Concord, Massachusetts. Woods Hill Table owns a farm in Bath, New Hampshire, where they raise their own meat. They offer a full raw bar and fresh fish caught off the coast of Massachusetts, and they even harvest their own maple syrup and honey for use in the restaurant. Local farms supply all their vegetables and grains, and Chef Charlie Foster uses international cooking techniques to create fantastic, seasonally-focused cuisine. Go to woodshilltable.com for reservations or call 978-369. 6300. Hello everyone, this is Chuck Clow from Above the Basement, Boston Music and Conversation. We have as today's guest a very talented violinist and artist, Siri Smedvig. Siri grew up in a musical family in Seattle and has played the violin since the age of seven. She has played with the Boston Pops and many other Boston freelance orchestras and has performed at Carnegie Hall and Lincoln Center with the American Symphony Orchestra. Our friend and sometime drummer Jonathan Beakley fills in for Ronnie Hirschberg this time around as Ronnie is in the studio working on a documentary soundtrack. It's very exciting. Our conversation covers a lot of ground, her upbringing in a very musical family, her thoughts on how she approaches music, art, and life in a joyful way. You can check out where she's playing and her artwork and other projects at SiriusMedvig.com. So here's our conversation with Siri, recorded at Woods Hill Table in Concord, Massachusetts. Can you hear yourself? Can you hear me? I I think I can, yeah. All right. Should I spin my gum out? Uh, Sure, if you want to. (laughs) I can hear me, like, chewing on Yeah, that's probably a good idea to spit your gum out. Uh, Hold on a second. Is there, like, a... Sorry. I didn't realize that classical musicians chew gum. Well, I stuck a piece in, I know. (laughs) See, a rock and roll musician would have just put this under the table, right? Yeah, I know. No, no. It's different. Yeah, I can't do that. (laughs) Except now I want to look under the table. (laughs) See how many rock and roll musicians he's interviewed. Yes, exactly. So thank you for joining us. The, the one thing I always like to start off, or at least you know, the few times that we've done this, mm-hmm. is, uh, is how I know you. Mm-hmm. Do you remember how I know you? I'm curious if you well, remember. Well, how I you remember Because people asked me, to, uh, my daughter asked me yesterday, I said I was uh, dressed up like a chicken. That's right, you were dressed like a chicken. Yes, because oh. I was in Chicken Man, and I was one of the hens that actually had the lay egg on stage. That's right. It's one of the better stories I've had about meeting somebody. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Where, and I, you wanted to know how I met her. I said, I can't tell you how I met yeah. her. <laughs> we got to find out after the fact. Yeah, so, this was not what I was expecting. So we were at Main Street in Concord, and the Butler Frogs were playing, and she walks in dressed like a chicken. And uh, and you were doing the sky is falling or something? What were yeah, you doing? Yeah, beak and everything. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you came in with the director, I think, yep. at the time, too. Yep. And uh, so it was definitely a conversation starter. Um, yeah. Why you're dressed like a chicken? Yeah, and you said you had done acting in New York. That's right. Yeah. I did. I did. Um, I don't think I've ever dressed up like a chicken, but I thought it was awesome <laughs> that you came in dressed like a chicken. And honestly, it really kind of encompasses what, from what I've learned about you, just by kind of just doing doing my research and things like that, finding yeah. out like what you've done and everything like that. You do so many things, you know, between your music and between your art. And you do voiceover work, and obviously yeah. you do you you act too. You do you do theater. Well, I was a pink Siamese in fourth grade too. A pink Siamese in, in fourth grade. Professional production. So animals are your are your forte. <laughs> Perhaps. All right. <laughs> and we had a previous guest who dressed in a pink gorilla outfit, I believe. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you know you. Oh, you well, know see, her. That, that is the the difference is that these are this is for a purpose. I don't just randomly. Do right. Of course. We don't. Yes, okay. You're not like the crazy chicken lady no, in, in town. Okay. We know that. Okay. Um, but our last guest was Sam DeSouze, who's friends with your daughter. Yeah. yeah. From Orchard House. Right. Right. Exactly. From Orchard House. She actually came to Beltane this year. To to what? Beltane. What is that? It, it's a celebration I do on May Day Eve every year. Oh, you just I did, you just posted p- pictures of yeah. people dancing yeah. on the maypole. Yeah. Your, oh, maypole I saw that. and jump over the fire for wishes. Oh, yeah. wow. That's very cool. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you met Jonathan, and Jonathan's our guest host today. Our, 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 the other host is um, actually in the recording studio right now. I'm available at a moment's notice. Are you? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, but uh, I guess we can start by talking about. Well, first of all, you're you're a violinist, right? And you yeah. and but you grew you grew up in a in a musical family, correct? Yeah, very musical. Your mother was a violinist. My mother as well. was a violinist in the Seattle Symphony, and she played um, in taught violin and also did chamber music and played. My father actually also was um, studied with Darius Mio, who was quite a famous composer. Mm-hmm. And um, while well, he was at Mills teaching, which is an all-girls school, but my dad went to the graduate program there. And this is in, Se- in no, Seattle? No, well, Mills is not in Seattle. But so they were, so, but my parents met in, in Seattle. Although okay. the, my father's from Norway and my mom's from Iceland. 
Your mother's from Iceland. Iceland, and, yeah. and, and so, what, they met there and they emigrated here? They met here? in Seattle, yep. And they both... Uh, oh, they met in Seattle. They, yeah, and they met in Seattle. Okay. Yeah. But they emigrated here before and, that. And uh, both ended up... Uh, yeah, my dad did much more jazz and... Well, what? he did classical, too. Actually. What did he play? He played clarinet, saxophone, and uh, piano. Oh, wow. And composed. Oh, neat. That was in taught school. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and but you took out... And you, but your mother was the violinist. My mother was the violinist, oh, yeah. Okay. And you started when you were seven. Yeah, I'd started a little before that. Like, I think I was five. Yeah. And she had me play the open strings. So I understood about the open strings. And then I accidentally sat on the violin. Uh-oh. It was in the case, but it cr- cr- kind of crushed it. So they had to take the violin a little quarter size. It's a very nice quarter size, actually. Ah. In fact, I played that quarter size in the Concord Parade. Oh, did you? I did. This, this last one we just the, had? Uh, no, not Patriot's Day Parade. It was another celebrating their birthday. of The Concord. 365 a few years yes. ago? They had a little group from uh, Concord Orchestra oh, neat. Parade. So it was my very first parade. Oh, cool. My dad used to always do the parade in Seattle. He was a parade leader with one of those little batani things. And well, don't feel bad. I, I I ran over. I bought a guitar last year, a brand new guitar, and I ran over it the day after with my car. <gasps> oh no! Yeah, I was, it's okay though. It it, I, it survived the it survived the crash. It, the case saved it. Yeah. Ugh. So well, thank God. Well, it is a live and learn because I don't. I've never sat on my violin. Since, I've never run over I'm my guitar careful. again. Yeah. So <laughs> exactly. I've learned my lesson for sure. Yeah. Um, this is why I play the drums. You cannot hurt them. You, cannot. <laughs> you bang them as a little, you know, that's, that's right. what you do. You, you, that's you're, the you're, effect, right? You're banging the crap out of them. Yeah. So you, both parents were musicians. So when you got into this, did you feel like it was a choice or did you feel like it was your destiny? And it was, you know, no, it's funny because, um, well, I have an older sister and brother. Well, my brother passed away last year, sadly. But uh, they both, being eight, eight and nine years older than me, everyone played already. So it wasn't a choice insofar as I it, I understood that that was what was part of what I thought everyone did. You know, it's like everybody thinks, you know, your family, everything is the same. I thought everyone played piano, of course, and then you picked an instrument that you played. And so, and, and my mom pressured me. I, I didn't really get choice about violin because my sister played flute. She had chosen flute and my brother had tried clarinet and ver- various different things and ended up with trumpet. Yeah, he was a horn player, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he played trumpet. So they had already played, in fact, and they were playing. Um, so mom had said, well, isn't anyone going to play violin? So that was when the violin was given to me. I sat on it. and But then years later, the, the first time I started seriously, so I always say, you know, on things that I started at seven, I started practicing every day. Right. Uh, the, the Suzuki kids had come around to Seattle and... Uh, they had a three-year-old playing something that I knew, like, I could play the open strings, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I couldn't play all that. So it was inspiring. And my brother was kind of, like, elbowing me, going, how come you don't sound like that? Oh, really? Yeah, so it was like, oh, thanks, Rolf. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so, but I did decide, like, I knew something internally clicked inside me. Sure. Which I know, like, with artwork, too, that when that happens, it's like, I know I have to do that. I have to do that. So, so it wasn't so much my parents forcing me. It was that inner click at that time that I knew, oh, I have to do this. I have, I have to do this. I know that. Would you? Was it like the the Von Trapp family? You'd all you'd all get together and you'd always ha- and you'd always play together. Although, yeah, I didn't know so much the Von Trapp family, right, and, yeah, and, yeah. but we did Brady Bunch or no? What was it? What was that? Partridge. The Partridge family. Yeah, we, I didn't watch so much TV, but I knew there was that family where <laughs> that's they all a, that's got the in correct, the bus. That's the correct reference. That's good. Okay. That works. And that's what we did. Like we would get gigs for the for the weekend, and we'd all go in the car. And we'd all, you know, I knew what I was supposed to play. I played that day anew. Rolf would play. My sister would play. But my mom rarely played. She came along and she'd be hemming our dresses and stuff in the car before. And then... Uh, she drove the big bus like <laughs> like the Partridge family <laughs> Actually, mom my, did. my dad drove. She she just kept track of things kind of thing. You know, it's really more like the Osmonds, right? A little bit country, a little bit rock and roll. So you were kind of more, cla- a little bit classical, a little bit jazz, right? Because your father played the jazz and your mother was more, more classical. Is that- yeah. Well, my dad, though, he actually, he knew classical music sort of through and through from a composer's standpoint. So in studying with uh, Mio, that was sort of more what he did. But in playing jobs and really just to earn money... He would play on the weekends with his Eagles Medvig band, uh, which was a jazz group. See, th- this is Big fascinating band. because when you meet musicians, you meet some who are very good at reading and very poor at improvisation. And then you meet some yeah. who are excellent at improvisation and very poor at reading. But you seem to be able to do both, right? Because you play this gypsy music and then you play the classical music and play all this other stuff, right? So, yeah, you know. I, well, I like all different kinds. Yeah. I, I like world music stuff a lot. And my mom really believed um, a lot of it. You know, I, my mother was my first teacher. 
So I have a huge influence from her. She also thought it was very important. Um, well, two things. At that time, I was growing up from the Suzuki method and all that. Mm -hmm. um, people tended to play a lot of Vivaldi. That was like the staple, like everybody learned Vivaldi and Baroque composers handle, you know. But she was a big Chrysler fan. And she grew up playing, actually, on the boat going up to Alaska. She was in playing in jazz bands, too. Oh, neat. So back in that day, in her day, they, they used a lot of strings. Now it's, they're using strings again, but there's a period where they weren't. So what was I saying? She, well, she, so she liked Chrysler, and she also liked very modern music, and my dad being a composer. Mm -hmm. So I uh, grew up playing Bartok duets with her all the time. Not that that's not even that modern. So we played, so from an early age, I played all different kinds of music. So how avant-garde can you get? Because I saw on the web that you play Stravinsky, right? I mean, do you go, do you go home yes. and turn on and, right and, and spring? Stravinsky, and like, again, really, Stravinsky's like, not that modern. Yeah, yeah. So well, like Stravinsky you know I mean, and Bartok, all, uh, you know, what, what's modern is um, I played, uh, when I went to, ta I started going to Tanglewood when I was 15. In one of those years, there used to be a week called Prom Week, which were the modern composers sort of featured week. And we would play those compositions. And those were often challenging. So I had one where it was more a performance piece, but it wasn't called that at the time. And, and um, I had to play my violin, and I had to chant at the same time. And there were various things I had to chant. And one of the chants, which I remember to this day, so, you know, it stayed with me, my mind is in the gutter. My mind is in the gutter. You had to keep on repeating that? And the piece that? was called... Um, Go to so it was something like you know wake up it's time to go to sleep. So one of these things you're trying to do where you pet your head and you well no rub you know my mom again because you know she's she's a very practical woman yeah and she used to always say you know don't spit on the violin whatever you do don't talk while you have the violin there you know because it's not good for the varnish okay so there were a lot of things not good for the varnish you know that's but, I think that's one good reason not so, to spit on the violin yeah I think there may be more than just one but. although I have to say I'm a huge fan of Eva Bitova. I don't know if you I know don't know who her, that is. Who, you know, so that's unusual music in a way because she sings and plays the violin. Okay, yeah, that is unusual. Yeah, and has sort of a, a different, it's very emotive. Yeah. Yeah. So I know in Concord, I mean, you play a lot around here. I know you have uh, the egg, with the egg. Egg rock. Quartet. Yeah, the Egg Rock Quartet. And is, yeah. that, is that your main gig now as far as your own personal project uh, kind of thing? No. I, well, I actually, some of the music I brought along to play, um, uh, well, in case, or to talk about, or whatever. Sure. I'm interested in doing, funny that I should say that, the mind is the gutter, that piece. I did a, <laughs> I did a senius, I called it. Um, so my first senius, so you can have senius one, two, three, and keep going. Uh -huh. um, this past October at 51 Walden. Yeah. Um, which I'm more interested because I'm an artist also. Right. I'm interested in that sort of overlap of different mediums. Okay. So, so... I took poetry and music, and there's a funerary violin tradition that I've been very interested in for a long time. Mm -hmm. That uh, this very odd man, I, can't, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, Ronan something starts with a K. Okay. Uh, anyway, but I found him on Twitter, and I asked permission if I could use his funerary violin book, which he gave me. And it's sort of this made-up world of his imaginings, I think, in part, and actual possible records of funerary violin. So you can picture, you know, sort of black and white footage in a cemetery yeah. with the lone violinist playing. Yeah. And it sort of captures a bit that mystical quality of when you're playing music, there is this other realm you can even have the audience. Everybody can go there if you do it right. Yeah. So or it's like with Harry Potter, you know, they have that port key. Yes. Everybody hangs on to the port key right. to go someplace else. Yeah. So that's that's part of what it is. So in my family growing up, we, like, you wouldn't get to go with the family, the port key, you know, if you weren't playing something and you didn't understand music in that way. Right. That that's the whole point. So it was a very, you know, now we were not a religious family growing up. Right. But music was... Our religion so it was a sacred thing everybody practiced every day everybody played we you know holidays we all played together and daily life we played together yeah so it was very much part of the everyday that's great I, I didn't have that you know growing up not that they weren't supportive or anything like that but I didn't have that family it's a whole it, there's dynamic a to it I would guess, yeah. yeah. There can't be all roses. I, yeah. would, I would suppose. We watched Wheel of Fortune every day. We did that as a family. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's, that's fun. Did. Yeah, yeah. A little less intense. I'd be more impressed yeah. if maybe it was Jeopardy or something yeah. like that, because then, no. then you had no. to, th and then you had to think. Like to keep it low. 
So is there anything that you won't listen to? I mean, is there anything that just like you know, electronica or, you know, country or rap or something like something that you just say, all right, no, you know, I, I just can't do this? You know, there's, I, what I find is that with any of the styles of music or types of music, there's good and bad. Yeah. It's yeah. sort of like with people, you know, like it's very hard to say any one. So for a while, I didn't listen to much country music, but I like country music now. Mm -hmm. And I like rap. However, growing up with mostly classical and with my upbringing, you know, my dad would always change the radio. I mean, I had friends who felt sorry, you know, like tried to expose me to rock and roll <laughs> because yeah. I, I was pretty sheltered in a way. I've tried to make up for that. So the rock and roll was probably the weakest category of what I listened to. So they wouldn't listen to any rock and roll, no, no. nothing like that My at parents all. were very classical music. In fact, even my dad listened to mostly classical music, not the big band stuff. He even played. as a jazz player, he still he wouldn't you wouldn't well, get exposed to that. Well, he knew the jazz guys pretty much too, though. But we, he didn't listen to it on as constant a basis as the classical. You got to Tanglewood when you said you were fifteen. Yeah, is that what brought you over to the East Coast? Yeah, yeah. Well, how, how, so how did that how did that work? Is what is explain what Tangle, uh, the Tanglewood is? Is it's a school? Yeah, well, that you were yeah. At, at the time, uh, it's the it was the BUTI program at the time, Boston University um, Tanglewood Institute. I think it was what it's called. They because my brother did that, I was really sort of following in his footsteps. Okay. And there was a man named Mr. Tips. Mr. Tips. And Mr. Tips came to dinner. I like that and, name. And uh, he sat and would um, I think it was behind a screen too that he listened to people play and chose who would get to go to Tanglewood. So, and I had gone to visit Tanglewood um, before we went to Iceland one summer. We stopped at Tanglewood, where Rolf was, and uh, so it just seemed like a natural thing that I would go and play there. Is it true that when you audition, you have to, not only do you play behind the screen so they can't see you and judge you by your appearance, but you also have to take your shoes off so they can't tell whether you're wearing heels or whatever. Have you ever experienced that before? No. No? Okay. <laughs> I, I I've never had to take my shoes off. You get it. No, it could very well be, I, I, you know, but maybe because I, I just had flat shoes on. Okay. But you were but you were 15, so what kind of, it wasn't a college that you were going to, it was a... It's the Boston Symphony Summer Home. Yeah. And there's a, a whole season that they play, and you get to be, uh, the Tanglewood BUTI program, you had private lesson once a week, uh -huh. and I studied with Roger Shermont, that um, actually this solo that I'm playing with Concord Orchestra coming up okay. um, is a piece that I studied with Roger Shermont. Which is kind of nice. He was French. Yeah. And it's saint so, so sort of oh, dance, makes sense. Dance macabre? Or no, um, introduction and capricioso. Okay. But same person. Same, same person. Same okay. composer. Okay. Yeah. Right. So anyway, so you took private lesson and then you had chamber music in the afternoon. And in the morning you played in an orchestra that was composed of people from all over the nation. Yeah. world, Actually. Yeah. And... It was fabulous. And so any of the conductors that were visiting Boston Symphony that week or, you know, a couple weeks or whatever would also conduct us. So from that early age, I had Leonard Bernstein. I mean, Oz Ozawa conducted us. Leonard wow. Bernstein. We had our regular conductor. Yeah. But then every guest conductor that came through. It was just an amazing. Was amazing. And I took it totally for granted. Of course you did. I mean, then, you know, I you're mean, a kid, yeah. so. Of course you don't. You always take, I, it, you always take it for granted. Until yeah. You realize how, oh my gosh, I can't believe all these people who I was who I was with, and I had no idea how great they were. Yeah. yeah. So do you feel like you peaked at 15? Yeah. And it's like all <laughs> no, there's a, funny, there's a funny little curve on the whole thing. I quit completely at one point. Did you, really? At one right. point. Around the time I got divorced, I just absolutely quit. So how, how old were you when, when you quit? 31. Okay, well, so you still had another 15 years of, of playing. And then you quit at 31, and then, how, and then how long were you away from the violin? Well, not that long. What happened was, uh, you know, because of the divorce, I think I got, you know, discombobulated. Sure. What was going on, and I had a very young daughter. Right. And I had to move, and I had to build a house, and I had horses, and I had, like, yeah, lots, just a lots lot. Lots to do. A lot to do, and I felt I couldn't be practicing for some reason. I couldn't play, and I just sort of folded in. And took an art class at De Cordova. Is that when you started? And that's when I started doing art. So that so and then at that point, the art I realized was exactly like music. And <laughs> so in that process, after only you know probably a couple of years, I went back to playing. I studied again, taking lessons and doing it very seriously. And it's it's better now playing than yeah. even when I was a kid. Really? In many ways. You enjoy yeah. you, because you enjoy it more, or I do. I feel more like it's. More fulfilling? Yeah, I... I uh, hard to explain? Yeah, it's kind of hard to explain. Yeah. 
But what? But a lot of what I had taken for granted as a kid, now I sort of understand in in a way. I understand how mysterious it is that I can't understand it. Yeah. That it, but it feels okay. Yeah. So you don't try to de- deconstruct the music anymore, or you you don't try to figure out why it moves you. You just accept it as as that. I mean, I don't know. Well, yes and no, but but you also kind of know like. Part of your job as being a musician is to figure out how, where you can fasten upon the parts that do allow for that. So that it's that whole attachment from the heart. And it's the same with drawing. You know, a felt drawing or a felt line feels different. So It's interesting, right? Because I think it was Bill Evans who played the piano for Dave Brubeck. And he yeah. was really fascinated by this particular type of Japanese art where you could draw the line. And then once you drew it, you couldn't you couldn't go back over it because of the thinness of the parchment or something like that. Mm. And he felt it was very similar to jazz music in that it's improvisational. And once you play that note, it's sort of gone. It's gone forever. Yeah. But when I so I looked at your art on the web and it's interesting because it looks very whimsical and kind of abstract and sort of playful whereas some of the music that you play whether it's Stravinsky or this other stuff seems very very complex and you know almost like austere and is it like, like is, is, the, is the visual art an antidote for the for some of the musical expression no it's actually directly like what I'm playing usually is exactly what I'm painting oh, really? so yeah so in fact the the collages which I have a very old website I, I I'm working on getting a new one but so a lot of the collages that have been in shows in the past few years started from an Elgar piece that we played and they had this one movement that was beautiful that was all a violin solo so it was this uh, uh, I think it was impromptu or interlude it was it was like a whole movement of this unbelievable and and the trip for me in playing it was you know every time you're playing it and you're in that like port key you know you're wherever you are yeah. you have all your experiences coming to that in your personal life and and I grew up from an early age with my mom telling me you know a sound picture you have to make a sound picture so it was always the music was always attached to something solid in a way so it was always like in my margins of the music I will have people's names certain things where you think of a certain person or a certain scene or a but, certain but something. you don't have like synesthesia or anything like that where you see colors when you hear a note and stuff like that right a version of it really? I, it's not so much that I mistake anybody for a hat <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That was a great book. Yeah, it was. But no, I don't have. Comes I, Oliver Sacks. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't have that. I always know who's the hat and who's the. Very good. Um, and because of that, in some ways, I think it frees me up for the artwork. Uh, it's not like I'm self-taught. Although my teacher of art once said, "Oh, you're very self-taught," but I'm not exactly. But I. But there's a part of that, like outsider art, that I do like a lot, and I understand that because if you're just doing what comes from that inside place. But yet I understand that it has to work on the page in the same way like playing a piece. You have to phrase it, and it has to be what the composer wants. So you're trying to kind of channel sort of someone who's possibly dead, you know, and what they wanted. And um, I don't know. We're playing Mozart, in fact, for Amadeus mm. before the that's quartet. Going on, that's before. going on right now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a different quartet, not egg rock, but a different quartet's playing and get to dress up as Mozart. Too. Oh, very yeah, nice. That's Mozart awesome. Costuming. Um, but in playing Mozart, I always feel like Mozart comes, is in the room somewhere. And, and he's incredibly playful. I don't know. I, there's a lot of playfulness in a lot of music that is serious still, too. Is it always connected for you? Do you, do when, you when you're when you painting or when you're drawing or whatever you're doing, are you listening to music? Is it coming out of the music, what you're doing? Or, or are they two yes. separate entities? At I ever, would say ever? yes. Yeah? But partly it's it's all that is because it's in your inner ear. Mm-hmm. So it's not like I don't have to, if I'm playing a Mahler symphony, for instance, there's, it's in me in a way. It's in my bones or it's in, you know, like you're, you're hearing it in your inner ear all day. Certain, you know, like comes out <laughs> in your head inside. Yeah. I mean, sure. you're not singing it necessarily, but, but it's in you. And so when you go to draw or paint or do something, it makes sense that it would come out, and it usually does. Well, you've done some really interesting stuff at the Talisman series and the Charm a Day, where you, I don't know, it was like three hundred something days straight. You had you did some piece, right? Yes. Where, that, yes. That's incredibly. Um, well, those are yeah, those are drawings, and that's it's almost I, like those are ongoing all the time. And that's very you gotta be very disciplined to do something like that every single day. I mean, they were. Yeah. Intricate stuff. It wasn't just like a pencil drawing. It was like different colors, and yeah. had, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff on there that yeah. doesn't take two seconds. You have to yeah. really kind of devote certain time yeah. to it. Yeah. Yet the the parameters for that project, 
the Charm a Day was what started it, and then I did Enchant a Day, and I did some Mysteriums, which had writing involved. And then right, um, right. right now I'm in the Talisman, Talisman series. Talisman series, yeah. So I do that uh, one a day. And it's very for me, it's very freeing, because you sit down, and it's directly whatever that divine whatever that is inside me tells me to do that day, yeah. which is what I need for that day sure. as a talisman, that's what comes out. So today it was a bird, and I was sort of surprised because I've been doing this wheel of blame for a little while. So so they do change, but um, but they're musically oriented, I guess, in, in a way, because I am. So we, we, have, we have a few minutes left, but I wanted to, uh, you know, I always want to see why such great musicians and people are, are here in Boston. I mean, obviously, yeah. you went to Tanglewood. Was that... That drew you just further to the to the coast. What brings you? What brought you to Boston to begin with? Uh, well, to, uh, because I had gone to Tanglewood. My my brother had a girlfriend. Um, be- that trip that I came to Boston to visit Tanglewood before going to Iceland with my mom, uh-huh. and she very much impressed me. And she said if she could do it again, she would go to Radcliffe. So that that's, was that's how right. I you ended went to up. Radcliffe. I, okay. So I ended that's up. Right. Um, I actually. You know, the BU gave me um, their performance award, which was very nice. Mm-hmm. And my parents were probably pretty hopeful that I would take it. It was a four-year full tuition scholarship. Wow. Yeah. And I felt badly, but I remembered that girlfriend he had that had said, oh, if I could do it again. So I thought, oh, no, I think I better, you know. And I had applied to Harvard, Yale, and um, BU. Terrible schools, all of them. Terrible schools. but And I only did that because of Tanglewood influence. Like the, the counselors that I had at school in, in Seattle Nobody cared. They were like, oh, you don't, why would you want to go there? You know? So I, I went there, and it was a fluke. I was actually playing a job. I had already sent my card into Yale, and it was partly because I had a crush on a trombone player that had gone to Tanglewood big and was mistake. already at Yale. Always a big mistake. A big mistake, yeah. Oh, it's it's, okay. So I had, I had a crush on this guy. I knew he was at <laughs> Yale, and so I thought, oh, okay, I'll send the card to the Yale. But then I had this weird, like one of those inner clicks again. And the inner click, I was playing on this program, and I was seventh on the program. The piece was seven minutes long. My dad, who's also a little quirky like this, Mm -hmm. noted that seven minutes long, seventh on the program, there were all these sevens that came up. And I realized, well, I have to go to Harvard. There's seven letters in it. There you go. And that click. You're a numerologist. Yeah. And um, and I talked to Silverstein, and he said, yes, it would be much better if you went to Harvard. I could teach you once a week. Uh, so Joseph Silverstein was um, sort of the teacher I'd really like to take with. Mm-hmm. And he said, if you go to BU, it'll be the same thing. People will be jealous and upset because I don't usually teach freshmen. If you go to Yale, I sometimes don't get to Yale on a, you know every week. It'd be once a month. So I thought, well, of course, the sevens, Silverstein can teach me. And so that's so I ended up going to Harvard. And that's how I ended up staying, staying here. here, except I did leave and go to New York City. But then I lived in Saudi Arabia. Wow. Then really? I came back here and sort of settled in Concord. I've lived in Concord longer than anywhere. How long have you been in Concord for? 20. Well, I was in Carlisle before that. So I don't know if that counts as the. Yeah, well, I'm in Car- Carlisle now. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, we're very separate, I think. Yeah, that's, a, that's the suburbs of, of that's, Concord. Yes, exactly. I, I guess it's, yeah. It, I used to have to explain it, a butts Concord. <laughs> it does. It, it does a butts Concord. That's yeah. That's exactly what it does. Yeah. To, like, my daughter's 27. I've lived here uh, uh, that long. In the house that I'm in Concord right here, mm-hmm. um, it's been 23 years oh, wow. since I built it. Yeah. So with all this talk of Ivy League institutions, that makes me think that the reputation that classical musicians have is that they are both intelligent and they're also quite eccentric, right? Like you meet these people who can play these very elaborate pieces, but yet they can't drive a car. And so I'm wondering, so, right, and so I'm wondering like, what's the most you know eccentric character you've ever met? And what I want you to do is name names if you could. Okay. <laughs> He's kidding. He's kidding. I've met a lot of eccentric people. Yeah. Usually it's the ones that look normal. I, I mean, if you meet an eccentric person and you're aware they're eccentric from the get-go, that's fine. But the ones that are really scary are the ones that appear quite normal and then just a little bit in, you realize, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Can't name names, though. So uh, I, have, I have another question. So cl- classical musicians, uh, ha- again, have a reputation for being straight-laced, and rock and roll musicians are the, uh, sybarites and, and, you know, hedonists and all that stuff. And I'm wondering <laughs> if that's really the case, because every time I see, you know, again, the, with the trombones, the trombone section, I think half these guys are hungover, you know? And is, that like, is, there, is there anything to that? I mean, is it, or, or is the reputation accurate? Yeah. I don't know that the reputation is is so. What I'm not sure what the reputation is that we're nerdy kind of. You're, ner- then you're nerdy. And is that true though, or is that undeserved? I probably am kind of nerdy. nerdy. Okay. But but you I do know how to drive nerdy. a car. Okay. I, that's I know how to break a law. <laughs> I know how to. Excellent. You know, that's a, 
It's an excellent I trait. I can dance. I can belly dance. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I can do. Are you are you hoarding plastic water bottles in Concord? Is that, is that, is that... <laughs> yeah, and grocery bags too. No. Grocery bags. No, no, no. I'm very pro nature. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Well, I mean, I got to tell you, um, you seem like a very, I don't know, I don't know, you, I don't know you very well, but you've come to see me play and, 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 and I've seen I you love, around. I love dancing. And and, I love, yeah, you love dancing. Great dance. You seem like a very joyful person. Yes. And you guys see it in your artwork and like, and just like yeah. in the, I mean, it's not, it's not like we're spying on you, but you know, we, you, <laughs> we have to find out more information about you before we talk to you. So yeah. and all the pictures I've seen about you, you just, yeah. you just seem like a, you know, very, very happy May, yeah. Maypole in your yard with horses and I mean it's well uh, yeah I mean just I like do, a chicken uh, the two my two big strong core beliefs are love and joy mm -hmm. so those I know that if I'm going too far afield from that it's not necessarily a good thing now that said I think the music helps a lot because if you play if you're very sad and I've been I've had a lot of tragedy in my life mm -hmm. but to play something sad and really to capture how you know the depths of despair you can play that, and there is such a way of sort of alchemizing it. Sure. And I think that I'm very grateful that I have that as a tool to be able to do that because life is so short, and losing my brother last year sure. was horrible, horrible, and so needless. And, and even with our, you know, the political climate right now, mm -hmm. so many of these things, I feel like now that I'm an adult, even though you know you never feel like an adult, no. exactly, but as an adult, I think, wow, people really go just in wrong directions and wrong meaning like not joyful right and and uh there's i forget what the bumper sticker is but i think thoreau said something joy is the natural condition of life or something like that and i think that's true because you look at little kids that you know do have that and it seems so sad we lose that yeah absolutely we do. Along. so so if it can add something to the world that is in that vein of that of loving it and being joyful and trying to share that uh, I, that's what i'm hoping to do well on that note would you like to play some joyful music for us? We'd love to hear you play. <laughs> I thought you, you brought, wanted a sad brought, funerary tune. No, well, you know, as long as <laughs> I it love helps playing dirge. As long as it helps me heal. If, you, if, if that's the if that's the case, we'd love to have you play if you would. Would you play yeah. for us? Okay. All right, awesome. Samuel Barber, Adagio for Strings. It's one of my favorites. Is it really? Yeah. Because that's considered to be the saddest recording yeah. ever, right? It's not that. It's just he understood melancholy. Yeah. You know, and to be able to, and that's, it's like connection again. So if you can connect with that, uh, someone who understands the depths of, how awful something can be, it helps heal you. Do you have any? Play whatever joyful <laughs> thoughts joyful. you have. Oh. <laughs> something, something, um, I See, don't know. See, my favorite is sad music. Your favorite is sad music? <laughs> we just got out of a week. no sense whatsoever. Yeah, I know. We uh, just got out of a week of rain. Let's, uh, yes, that's true. That is true. Okay. Should I play the gypsy one? Sure. <laughs>
nice. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you for doing that. Do you play like any Irish stuff? Yeah, there? that's right. They have those air. Do you want to do you want a Bach or something like? Do you ever go into Irish uh, bars and like sit in the circle and do that kind of stuff? I do, and I took with some some great people in that um, camp. I went to New York where when Mark O'Connor's camp went, was in New York for a couple times. Yeah, and um, they had wonderful people doing that. I love that. that stuff. Yes, me too. And the tap dance stuff. I mean, the Irish dancing. The Irish dancing with yeah. the legs all not moving there. Yeah, the, just the feet. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wow, you're playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. While you're playing, can you yeah. while you're playing? You, can you yeah, I can. Home? Yeah, I remember my daughter came home from one of those, and she did it. Her seven feet fell. I was like, ah, the violin. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She'll be fine. Yeah, it's the violin that's gonna cost. Yeah, exactly. No, so yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for for well, doing this. Thank it, you. You were so talented. It's great to have you here. Well, and um, you. is your you said you? I know. I mean, you, 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 your website. I know it's it's not totally up to date. But um, no, it's very old. But can can we send people there? Right yes, now? because I'm going to use the same. You know, my right. name is going to be seriousmedvig.com. Seriousmedvig.com. Because um, you have your artwork ha- there. Yes, I've already paid a deposit to the fellow that hopefully will oh. help me put so up. So now you name. have to update. The it, other right? thing that I'm very excited about and is yet to come is like new worlds, like really using alchemy and having virtual reality. So I'm partnering with a guy in um, California, Silicon Valley, that's going to be doing the VR. You know the the Google Rift. glasses, yes. yes. Well, yes. Well, Google glasses, because now they're cheaper. You know, the cardboard version. It'll be the same as okay. the uh, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so that's my next project. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll turn this off now. Thank you. All. So that is our show for today. I want to, of course, thank Sirius Medvig for being such a great interview and joyful human being. Also, a special thanks to Jonathan Beakley for sitting in for Ronnie and for his great conversational skills. We shall see Jonathan again, I am sure. And finally, we are always grateful for the hospitality of Woods Hill Table for letting us record there. If you want more information about Siri, you can go to SiriusMedvig.com. Check out our own website at AboveTheBasement.com where you can sign up for our newsletter, listen and subscribe to our podcasts, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, and look at all the nice pictures we post on Instagram. We are everywhere. On behalf of Jonathan, Ron, and myself, thanks for listening. Tell your friends, and remember, Boston music, like its history, 